Hola, buena tarde, buenas tardes. Domingo al Magba. Um, es realmente un placer estar hoy aquí. Bueno, yo soy Ferran Baremlitz, soy el director del museo. Um, es un... ya que he mirado Pablo Martínez. Bueno. Um, um, como decía, perdón, es un, es, es un placer realmente estar uh, hoy aquí presentando uh, este seminario, esta de, de una tarde muy, muy intensa que bajo el título Estética Investigativa, Acontecimiento y Huella, vamos a, de, vamos a hablar sobre algunas cuestiones que atraviesan transversalmente eh, el proyecto de Forensic Architecture que se puede visitar en la segunda planta uh, del museo, la exposición hacia una estética investigativa del grupo Forensic Architecture. Um, pero so, sobre todo también hoy queríamos aprovechar esta ocasión para presentar eh, el libro Forensic Architecture hacia una estética investigativa que hemos eh, publicado conjuntamente con el MUAC, el Museo Universitario Arte Contemporáneo de la Ciudad de México, donde la exposición se verá también a partir del mes de septiembre, en algún momento en paralelo, um, con notables cambios también cuando llegue allí. Y, um, y muy feliz de presentar este, esta publicación, que es realmente una, una publicación uh, muy interesante y creo que una, una verdadera aportación a, a, al conocimiento no solo de la, de la exposición, uh, sino de todo aquello que Forensic Architecture lleva haciendo desde hace ya casi una década. Um, el, el, el libro primero parte de un, de un, de un texto que hemos escrito a, a, a cuatro manos entre Cotemo Medina, el curador jefe del MOAC, y yo mismo, um, para pasar después a un diálogo que yo encuentro realmente muy, 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 muy interesante, que fue publicado originalmente en la revista October, um, entre Eyal Weisman, uh, Yves Alain Bois, uh, Michel Ferrer y Hal Foster, Um, un, un, un texto que eh, publicarlo creo que en español es eh, particularmente significativo, particularmente útil para entender uh, muchas de las cuestiones que están detrás de, del trabajo de Forensic y de la forma de, de operar de colectivo. Y después pasamos a seis textos que son, eh, yo creo que fundamentales también, que, que siguen la exposición en, eh, un, un poco por delante o por detrás, porque van uno por uno desgranando todos aquellos capítulos, todas aquellas investigaciones que se presentan en la segunda planta. Uh, que van desde, el, desde, la, desde la primera de ellas, algo que ocurre en una habitación, hasta la última, algo que ocurre en un desierto, um, en, en, una, en una serie de, de espacios que van increciendo, que permiten entender casi desde, una, desde un punto de vista muy corpóreo, muy humano, um, cómo todo eso puede ser entendido como arquitectura y cómo todo eso puede ser un lugar en el que se, se, se trascienden un montón de cuestiones que, que van directamente relacionadas con uh, nuestra vida como humanos y nuestra esencia como humanos. Uh, la exposición acaba, y el libro también, con, uh, con las cuestiones relacionadas con la propuesta para el Centro de la Naturaleza Contemporánea, um, una, una forma de entender uh, una, una proyección sobre esa naturaleza, tal como hace un tiempo se hizo con la cultura, si hace 30 años entendíamos que la cultura se tendría que entender como un producto contemporáneo que se miraba con ojos de la actualidad, es momento también de pensar eso con la naturaleza, porque eh, sin duda la, natura, la naturaleza es, eh, está totalmente modificada, por, no, no solo por cómo la estamos modificando, tal como se habló en esta misma mesa hace un par de semanas en el seminario Petróleo, ¿no? como uh, um, llevamos siglos haciéndolo a una velocidad relativa, pero a una velocidad descomunal en las últimas, en las últimas décadas, agotando un planeta y en el cual Uh, tenemos que, que entenderlo a partir de los ojos de lo que es actual y de lo que y, y a partir de, lo, de, aqu, de aquellas formas de entenderlo como un producto contemporáneo en sí mismo. Um, la exposición se inauguró hace algo más de un mes. Um, es un mes en el que han ocurrido muchas cosas. Un mes en el que eh, ahora mismo he estado hablando con Eyal y me, me explicaba su ultimísimo trabajo presentado solo hace un 10 días en, en Kassel. Un trabajo que vuelve a utilizar eh, un modelo arquitectónico, un pensamiento arquitectónico para, a, pon para poner en evidencia, de hecho, es el resultado de una investigación judicial realizada en Alemania a partir de un ataque neonazi en el cual la reconstrucción arquitectónica del espacio es fundamental. Un mes en el cual también hemos tenido mucho, mucho feedback de la exposición, hemos tenido muchas lecturas. Um, yo le he podido personalmente explicar muchas veces y, y cada vez 
uh, puedo ir uh, destacando cosas, cosas nuevas, ¿no? cosas que yo mismo voy descubriendo a lo largo de, a, a lo largo de la exposición, a lo largo de explicarla, uh, viviendo la extremada relevancia que tiene en este momento hablar de estética investigativa y cómo nos encontramos ante un, ante una, ante, ante un momento clave en el cual la verdad es un campo de batalla. Um, cuando empezamos a ir a esta posición, mmm, todavía no gobernaba Trump en los Estados Unidos. Uh, cuando empezamos a pensar en ella, uh, todavía la noción de posverdad no se había convertido casi en un chascarrillo cotidiano. Y sin embargo, hoy vemos cómo uh, la verdad es algo que se, que se modela, que se adapta ideológicamente, se tergiversa. Um, un, grup un grupo como Forensic lo que nos muestra precisamente es que la verdad... Es un campo de batalla, además una batalla que se puede ganar, una batalla que se puede ganar a partir de, de la investigación y a partir de proyectar sobre ella lo que ellos mismos denominan una estética investigativa, que, en la cual demuestra que si en algún momento a lo largo del siglo XX, cuando iba avanzando ese siglo XX y iba aumentando el nivel de percepción del horror, Uh, se consideraba quizá que el arte, que la cultura podía ser un reducto de paz, un reducto aparte, un, un reducto que no estuviera contaminado precisamente por todo ese horror, uh, precisamente era lo contrario, ¿no? que la forma precisamente de, en la cual es, podíamos afrontar el horror era precisamente a través de, uh, del arte, ¿no? de, a, precisamente a través de generar, como ellos dicen, una estética investigativa. Sin más, me gustaría dejarle la palabra a Pablo para que presente lo que va a ocurrir esta tarde, uh, en que creo que va a ser especialmente intensa. Bueno, pues gracias por la presentación, Ferran. Eh, yo no me voy a extender mucho más porque Ferran ha introducido de manera eh, bastante detallada el contexto de, de este seminario. Este seminario es el, el, la segunda actividad pública que realizamos dentro de, de, en paralelo a la exposición. La primera fue un debate que tuvimos aquí el mismo día de la inauguración en la que hablábamos de justicia, activismo y derechos civiles, ¿no? en el que, el que contamos con, entre otros, Baltasar Garzón y el propio Yal Weisman. Y hoy nos interesaba avanzar en el debate un mes después en algo que está siendo fundamental en las investigaciones que estamos desarrollando tanto en los programas públicos como en el programa de estudios independientes del museo como en otros espacios que, que se están dando a lugar en, en, bueno, en, en, en el último programa del MACBA, ¿no? que tiene que ver con una reivindicación o con, con una búsqueda de ciertas epistemologías conectadas con los nuevos materialismos y con el y con el materialismo. ¿no? En este sentido, como bien indicaba el Ferran también, hace, nos parecía interesante dos semanas después de haber tenido aquí el seminario de petróleo, ¿no? en el que hablábamos de los límites sobrepasados de, 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 de la naturaleza ¿no? por parte de, la, de las políticas extractivas de, derivadas del capitalismo y del desarrollo industrial vinculado al petróleo y, a la, y al uso de las energías fósiles, nos parecía interesante hoy introducir algunos de los temas de los que trabaja, con los que trabaja Forensic Architecture y que están también conectados con un concepto que nos interesa comenzar a hablar o a debatir ¿no? o proyectar en la esfera pública, ¿no? como es el del ecocidio, ¿no? o como es el, el asesinato sistemático de la naturaleza por parte de la, de la acción humana. ¿no? Eh, la tarde de hoy está de esta manera pensada en torno a tres en tres momentos ¿no? que se indican casi en el título del seminario de hoy, ¿no? Estética investigativa, acontecimiento y huella. ¿no? El primero es Susanne Schupli, que ahora vendrá, subirá aquí a acompañarme, ¿no? en el que ella desde una práctica artística, y nos parecía también interesante introducir aquí directamente dentro de las metodologías de Forensic cómo están entrelazadas con las prácticas artísticas o con intervenciones de numerosos artistas y aportaciones artiste, de artistas. ¿no? Susanne Schupli viene hoy a... a, a a desarrollar un concepto que, en el que ella está trabajando y que tendrá dentro de poco una publicación, ¿no? que es el de eh, testigo material y el, y el que justamente incide en esta forma o en, o en la cuestión de... Bueno, de qué hablan los objetos o qué nos cuentan los objetos o qué datos podemos traer directamente de lo material ¿no? o, de, o, de, o, de, o de las o de, sí, de, lo, de los objetos, ¿no? de las cosas. Después Hannah Metzaros Martin nos hablará de, un, de una manera detallada, luego la presentaré en su momento, sobre este concepto de cocidio ¿no? y con eh, bueno, la, le, los conflictos en Colombia. ¿no? Y acabaremos la tarde abordando el concepto de estética investigativa o la estética de investigación entre Matt Fuller y el propio Ella. 
Royal Wiseman. ¿no? En, al cabo de cada una de las intervenciones podremos tener un turno de preguntas y abrir el debate en la sesión de hoy. Y sin extenderme nada más, como os decía al inicio, yo creo que vamos a dar ya paso a Susanne Schupli, que es artista, escritora, Profesora en el Center for Research of Architecture en Goldsmith, en la Universidad de Londres, y su obra examina, como decía antes, las pruebas materiales de la guerra y los desastres medioambientales. Así que, sin extenderme mucho más y saludando también a quienes nos siguen por el streaming, eh, doy paso a, a Susan. Muchas gracias por estar hoy aquí. Gracias. Thank you very much for the invitation to spend some time with you this afternoon and to present some ideas. Uh, in particular, I just had a very quick um, run through the kind of extraordinary and expansive exhibition. So I wanted to thank Ayel and the curator Rosaria, who's not here. Um, so thank you so much for also including um, other kind of works that were very much influenced by my time with, uh, with forensic architecture. Um, certainly uh, also uh, need to thank the whole team here in, uh, in their assistance with the installation of the work, but also Pablo and Yolanda for um, bringing us all together in these public forums. What I would like to do, and this is a little bit of an experiment because I have a little bit of um, a luxury of time, which is 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 um, is a kind of is something that I'd like to work with. I thought um, I would create a bit of a montage and walk you through or sketch out, if you will, the uh, concept of the material witness that I've been developing. So some writing, some of my archival materials, and then. Um, clips and images from uh, different art, uh, um, art projects. So it's very much in the spirit of kind of montage, and I hope by the end of it, you'll have some insights into the ways in which I'm trying to develop this concept. So, so material witness is a concept that I've developed around which a series of artworks and writing projects emerged. It's an exploration of the evidential role of matter as both registering external events as well as exposing the partisan practices and procedures that enable such matter to bear witness. Material witnesses are non-human entities and machinic ecologies that archive their complex interactions with the world, producing ontological transformations and informatic dispositions that can be forensically decoded and reassembled back into a history. Material witnesses operate as double agents, harboring direct evidence of events as well as providing circumstantial evidence of their interlocutory methods and epistemic frameworks whereby such matter comes to be consequential. Material witness is in effect a Mobius-like concept that continually twists between divulging evidence of the event and exposing the event of evidence. Rather than reducing their capacity to stand convincingly as technical witnesses to a crime, the electronic defects of Loshi's massacre tape and the digital artifacts encoded by the anonymous execution video supplement their capacity for testimony. Their impoverished technical production amplifies the radical incomprehensibility of the events they archive. Erratic movement, blurred focus, and dropout made to speak on behalf of those who no longer can. Forcing wholeness and clarity from the massacre videos, distressed image fields would violate the events anew, which is what happened under cross-examination and forensic analysis. Yeah. 
Do you think do you think this tape has been doctored in any way or does it represent what you saw at the scene? No, I don't think so. But because I have uh, the other VHS tape which is in a, a tribunal possession possession now and these two can be compared very easily. Doubt always enters the law at the level of the cut, the edit, the splice. A different strata of knowledge about these events of crisis, knowledge that arises out of processing, is impelled into presence, activating the sensorial domain of testimony at the moment that the plane of resemblance, the appearance of things, gives way to the furtive emissions of the ontological substratum. At these moments of intensified image compression, a material witness might be said to emerge from within the depth of magnetic particles or pixels. In pursuing this research, I've examined a wide range of materials that record a trace evidence of the violence which generated their context and explore the institutional and disciplinary protocols that enable their histories to be rendered intelligible and made to speak even if their speech acts often fall, oftentimes fall upon deaf ears or challenge accepted truths. My case studies draw upon many events in which technical media and natural media systems combine to record a violation or transgression. На экране один из кадров, который студийный АТК сначала задержал как брак. Но это не брак. Это зримый лик радиации. Вглядитесь. The release of radioactive materials into the air and water had begun. While Chernobyl's fallout would eventually spread across extensive tracts of arable land throughout Europe, Fukushima's contamination seems to have traveled further still, crossing some 7,600 kilometers through the vast microbial channels of the Pacific, reaching the western shores of British Columbia many years later. say that traces of radioactivity from the nuclear accident in Japan four years ago have washed up on Canada's coastline. It's the first time they've detected materials from the accident in North America, but they say the amounts don't pose a threat to living creatures. Throughout my research, I've tried to signal the specific conjunction between matter and evidence that shapes this enterprise as a particular kind of political project, 
one that discloses different orders of knowledge and conditions the regimes of visibility that enable materials to become evidential and bear witness. Indeed, what my artworks and case studies aim to highlight is the degree to which a perceptual rearrangement of matter exposes the contingency of witnessing, soliciting questions about what can be known in relationship to what can be seen or sensed, about who or what is able to bestow meaning onto things, about whose stories will be heeded or who's dismissed. Such rearrangements also raise questions about the specific requirements that must be met to secure the act of witnessing, whether certain practices and procedures should be enlisted or perhaps rejected. In conducting my research, I've tried to account for the ways in which the responsiveness, the responsiveness of matter to external forces demands an acute and renewed sense of medium specificity in order to grasp the full political implications that such ongoing changes or interactions might yield. Today, the vicissitudes of material witnessing are perhaps best exemplified by the range of stakeholders, knowledge claims, moral values, and risk strategies that gather around issues of global warming. For example, in Zacharias Kunuk and Ian Morrow's film, Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change, which also inspired my own work, Can the Sun Lie?, which is in the exhibition upstairs, several Inuit elders make the repeated observation that the, set, the setting sun has slowly been moving further west and that the location of the stars, too, has altered. Has the Earth shifted on its axis, they ask, causing the position of the sun and stars to change? These are some um, just film stills uh, from the film, which was actually, it's subtitled in English, but it was actually a film that was entirely um, narrated in Anuktutuk. When their documentary was pre-screened at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference in December 2009, the filmmakers were ad 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 admonished by the scientific community for presenting such a spurious hypothesis on the part of the in Inuit, despite the fact that they had clearly looked to Western physics in attempting to explain this extraordinary transgression on the part of the sun. We had a litany of scientists, this is a quote from the two filmmakers, we had a litany of scientists come back to us responding after seeing this news, saying, well, this is great to be speaking to indigenous people about their views, but if you continue to perpetuate this fallacy that the earth has shifted on its axis, the Inuit would lose all credibility. The Inuit's deep ancestral knowledge of the environment in which they lived and the events that they had witnessed were insufficient for conferring a contingent legitimacy on their speech acts if their testimonials ran counter to widely accepted scientific truths. The epistemic value of objectivity, or rather the epistemic virtue of objectivity, so valued by the scientific community, turned not upon a distinction between Western rationality and native cosmology, as might be expected, but rather upon who or who has the authority and thus expertise to speak on behalf of science itself. This is what linguist Paul Goodwin identifies as the professional vision of trained judgment. Quote, different professions, medicine, law, the police, specific sciences such as archeology span have the power to legitimately see constitute and articulate alternative kinds of events. Pro professional vision is perspectival, lodged within specific social entities and unevenly allocated." End quote. So although the Inuit may have come to the wrong scientific conclusion in speculating that a physical realignment of the Earth's axis had caused the locational drift of the sun, rather than the cumulative effects of industrialization, resulting in the production of greenhouse gases, their observations were not in and of themselves flawed. Their eyes had not deceived them. 
Indeed, the rapid and extreme environmental changes that have overturned established perceptions of the natural, of the natural world throughout the North suggest that only an equally radical proposition might, be, be, might begin to explain the hallucinogenic dynamics of matter now evident in these transformative geographies. To be clear, if the material witness is indeed to function as an operative concept, then it is not merely a question of exposing the discursive practices and forensic procedures that produce the conditions of visibility whereby only legal matter attains its legitimating force and thus capacity to testify, as that would of course grant excessive power to juridical and techno-scientific apparatuses in determining what constitutes the event of evidence. The point is to push at the limits of these institutional forums and disciplinary formations in order to question their authority and radicalize what matters as evidence and who and what counts as a material witness. The initial provocation that actually triggered um, my thinking around the material witness was in fact a brief comment made by the philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, who admonished scientists that came to their subjects with their hypothesis well in hand and merely sought to test its validity and thus confirm or deny their initial premise. She writes, I'm beginning to suspect that a large part of the research has been done with the ulterior motive of, of imposing an answer on it, if only we were content to let the material speak. Researchers, she argued, must accept the possibility that it is not man, but the material that asks the questions, that has a story to tell, which one has to learn to unravel. So while natural scientists tend to privilege brute matters of fact as the only true origin of reality, social scientists make language the sole condition of intelligibility. Invoking the speech acts of things is not to propose a recoding of materiality as a quasi-linguistic form that would bring it closer to the social sciences, nor is it a rhetorical displacement of a materiality into a set of signifying relations that would compose matter into intelligible patterns. It is rather a demand made on, the, on behalf of materials that we apprehend the expressive potential of matter to reorganize accepted points of view and customary truths, admitting in essence that the dynamic properties of matter can also bring about a reorganization of our own sensibilities and beliefs. In shifting the function of speech to the technicity of sense production, I propose a somewhat more potent reading of Stenger's, in which the material not only has the power to make and bear witness to history, but also brazenly speaks back. Stenger's has also suggested that we call an innovative hypothesis a propositional fiction, in that it may not be verifiable today or even tomorrow, but that as a proposition, it holds out the possibility of becoming a fact at a later date. She says, to speak of fiction concerning an innovative scientific proposition does not mean saying it is only fiction. The example she cites is that of Alfred Lothar Wegener, a German meteorologist who made the daring proposition in 1912 that the continents once formed a supercontinent called Pangaea which had fractured and whose land masses were slowly drifting apart. His proposition was roundly rejected at the time and relegated to the realm of fiction until the late 1960s, when, as Stengers puts it, the movement, not of the continents, but of the plates on which they rested, confessed to their mobility. The evidence that testified to Wegener's proposition was quite literally a material witness, the Earth's crust itself, whose plate tectonics provided the crucial proof to support a theory of continental drift. The acceptance of the theory by geologists, however, took decades and emphasizes the degree to which the capacity for evidence to testify convincingly requires not only the development of new technical probes for the detection, measurement, and analysis of the dynamics of matter, but that it also be tested in the appropriate public forums in which such witnessing can properly take place. 
Today, these tend to be juridical and scientific forums, whereas in the pre-modern era, theological courts held sway over the miraculous appearance of evidence. However, such enunciative framework still remain highly partisan in nature, governed by agreed upon practices and rules of procedure. Nowhere is this disciplining of acts of witnessing more notable than in the criminal tribunal, one of the key apparatuses that I cross-examine with respect to the contemporary production of evidence. Within a juridical context, the material witness is a person who is deemed to have information germane to the subject matter of a lawsuit or criminal prosecution that is significant enough to affect the outcome of a trial. In other words, the witness, by means of the information they may possess, is considered sufficiently pertinent to the legal proceedings that every effort must be made to procure their testimony. Humans become witnesses when their knowledge or experience positions them as semantically material to a case. Now, with respect to Mr. Tachi's tape, am I correct that this tape was at one point in time stolen by some thieves? Yes. Uh, at the time where I was looking for this tape, his own camera was stolen. I believe not because of the tape, but because of, the tape was stolen because of camera. The thief didn't even know what was in. And then, uh, with the help of Shaban Dragai, I get uh, a hold of this tape again. You say with the help of Shaban Dragai, were the persons who had stolen the camera, were they members of the KLA? I don't know. Okay. All matter registers evidence of certain histories. But not all materials become evidential in the sense of disclosing or bearing witness to these historical processes. As far as the filming of the tape is concerned, uh, you had already stated that you did not accompany at all times Mr. Tachi as he filmed. Now, with, in particular, with the segment that we saw earlier today, the first segment where we saw uh, the, the first set of bodies, uh, as a medical doctor, would you have expected there to be more blood at such a dramatic and large numbered amount of corpses in the same location, particularly more blood on the ground surrounding these bodies. Would I, would I expect it as a medical doctor? I don't yes. know. I don't know. Okay. But I'm telling you that I saw lots lots of blood there. And if you look carefully at those tapes, you'll, you'll be able to see some of it too. To borrow, the concept of, to borrow the legal concept of the material witness and then rework it through a model of non-human agency is to consider evidence not solely in terms of what it describes, perhaps somewhat metaphorically as the testimony of things, but also what it can do as a set of aesthetic and political operations, which is to create a space wherein, ma wherein matter and evidence converge to pose questions about what can be established as a potential fact and what can be envisioned as a propositional fiction. One of my ongoing tasks as an artist and researcher is therefore to highlight the ways in which law tries to work out this space theoretically within the domain of culture and aesthetics. Certainly science does not belong to the domain of the scientists alone, nor by extension should an interest in aesthetics or legal processes remain exclusively to the study of art or the jurisdiction of law. 
We need, to, we need rather to be attuned to the ways in which different knowledges and their expressive practices are already mutually effective. However, as I've stressed throughout, the mere fact that materials capture and archive eventful processes within their substratum or harbor information as metadata does not convert such entities into de facto material witnesses capable of testifying before the tribunals of history. The legal distinction, which is in fact an administrative one between the material witness as someone who can bear witness to an event and the technical witness as that which can offer material evidence of events but cannot testify on its own accord, is confronted throughout my work. The non-human plaintiffs and witnesses that I call upon to testify might seem better positioned to narrate the object world with the transparent objectivity and disinterest so cherished by the court than their arguably more subjective human counterparts. However, their implicatedness within the complex infrastructures and processes that convert material inf inscriptions and inf informatic dispositions into evidential entities that can be held accountable to the events that they record eschews any possibility that the material witness remain free from bias or prejudicial entanglements. And I just, I'm going to run through um, just a, a snapshot of a whole bunch of different sort of um, investigations and sort of projects that I have uh, worked on. So I hope I, this is just a very kind of small kind of insight. So it might seem a little bit chaotic. So some of these will be, um, some of these material witnesses that I'm examining, for example, would be um, film footage contaminated by a lethal dose of radiation. And this is the trial that was subsequently held and then a, a large uh, uh, demonstration in Kiev. So I'm also looking at the trial in relate the, the trial subsequent to the events at Chernobyl. Um, we've heard a lot already about uh, the massacre video from the two clips. Uh, which uh, two different uh, massacres that come out of situations of ethnic conflict, Kosovo 1999, Sri Lanka in 2009. This is a, a more recent uh, case I've been working on from the Dokmanovich trial, also in the ICTY, in which, uh, a which was a camcorder recording of a video um, that was entered into, into court as evidence that the protagonist or perpetrator, Dr. Manovich, wasn't at the Karo farm, but um, a British tree expert, an andrologist, was called into court and he could actually you, uh, he could actually prove that the video alibi, in fact, was false based on the unique branching structure of trees, which um, he claims, Paul Tabish claims, are much more are, are much more unique than human fingerprints. Other things that I've looked at are the transmission of this. The trans, this is a, the transmission of this very iconic photograph was actually sent from Saigon to Tokyo to New York as a audio file over the st over standard telephone kind of relay. And although we've seen this image before, this is the way it actually first appeared on the cover of the New York Times as a highly kind of degraded um, image. And some of the research I've done into this particular case study involves the ways in which... Um, atmosphere in climate weather, so storm conditions, etc., and also the atmosphere in uh, this part of the region of, of Vietnam was very also extremely noisy due to telecommunications between different sort of fighter pilots, etc. So there's actually quite a lot of discussion in relationship to this transmitter technology that it was always pulling in extraneous information into the uh, transmissions that it was sending. So my argument with this particular image is also looks at the ways in which it's actually also there's a certain kind of noise from atmospheric. Um, this would be my propositional fiction, that there's a certain amount of noise that is entered into that image uh, uh, because of the kind of specific um, technical um, organization of the machines that are required to, to transmit such an image. 
Um, another case that I've worked on quite a bit concerns an 18 and a half minute tape gap, I think in Watergate tape 342. So this is an American situation. And these are some of the archival images that I've collected in relationship to the actual um, trial. And here's these very infamous tapes were actually escorted under armed guard to the National Archives in Maryland. And then I've produced various um, art installations in relationship to this um, very historic 18 and a half minutes of silence that is recorded in, that is um, kept in the vaults of the U.S. National Archives. And um, it's considered one of their most kind of precious artifacts. So I was always... Um, I always found that kind of extraordinary that one of the most significant things in the National Archives of the U.S. was actually um, a piece of silence. Other things that I've worked on in this regard is looking at the ways in which um, scientists um, are looking at the kinds of... Um, uh, the, the ways in which certain technical processes, so such as the kind of oil film... Um, and maybe, actually, I'm going to skip over that. I think it's too complicated, and I, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But um, some of the other cases that I've looked at are looking at the ways in which certain kinds of technical systems that actually incur uh, in uh, contexts of pollution and toxicity actually have operate according to a certain logic that we could actually identify with photography and film. So there's a chemical kind of set of relationships that happens in many, um, in many situations of environmental pollution, such as photochemical smog would be another one. Oil film is another one. Uh, these are quite interesting to argue that these technical systems that we find within uh, damaged ecosystems or environments might actually be operating as a kind of de facto uh, self-imaging um, system, if you will. Um, and this, uh, something I've written about in the past, concerns the forensic analysis of World Trade Center dust. So six months after the collapse of the Twin Towers, there was uh, a high incidence of respiratory ailments, etc. And so the forensic analysis um, shows us that what we what we actually um, what that dust actually contains is an amalgam of the entirety of the event, so including all of its of course, it it's uh, all of the human beings that uh, worked in those towers and all and but through that forensic analysis we can also uh, look at the history of asbestos and and which was um, banned uh, partially through the building of the towers so. By looking at the sort of forensic analysis of the dust, I could start to investigate other um, histories attached to that event. I think I'll continue. And uh, maybe the last example, which I, I, I bring it in insofar as it, we saw that in the earlier clip, was the ways in which we also have... Um, in this case, environmental systems that carry the sort of, uh, if one can sort of read them properly, one can sort of um, understand the history of violence that is registered by an environmental system. So I, w I argue that at these junctures of ontological reckoning, history, and by extension, a certain politics be um, is, is, is in fact kind of registered. So in disclosing and publicly testifying to these deliberate events or accidental encounters, the material witness makes evident the very conditions and practices that convert such evidential materials into matters of evidence. The cases that I examine emerge primarily out of situations of political violence and legal contestation, even if conventional armed conflict are not their attributing source, nor indeed any juridical accountability necessarily ensues. This is because the various material witnesses that I ana analyze and present come out of contexts that may require regime change before they can be called upon to testify legally, as is the ongoing situation sh in Sri Lanka with regards to the mobile phone footage that we've seen clips of um, today documenting alleged war crimes on the part of the state against its minority Tamil population. And just um, 
a few more uh, stills from the video and then a short audio clip from the UN Special Rapporteur. This tape became very, very controversial and was the subject of two UN inquiries. Actually, and this is what we did as well, is then to get a video and audio uh, specialist, forensic specialist, to look at the possibility of any special effects. Uh, also to get a forensic pathologist, a medical doctor, to look at the evidence concerning blood, uh, body movements, um, and to comment on that, whether these are actual people consistent with the, the profile of people actually dying. And then also a ballistics expert to look, amongst other things, at the recoil um, and, and the uh, emissions to see whether that is consistent with live um, ammunition being, being fired. So although the two different UN special reporters subjected this um, anonymous execution video to various forms of forensic analysis, including by a medical pathologist, to this day, uh, the Sri Lankan state claims that this, this tape, in fact, was a hoax. So the... So other forms of evidence may well be the consequence of aggregate actions conducted over many years by multiple um, actors and may therefore not meet the legal condition of direct causality, as, so, as is so often the circumstance governing claims of environmental crime. And this in some way is, is explored in uh, the trace evidence video that's in the um, forensic architecture exhibition here. I'll play another clip from that. Which is from the first part, which deals with uranium mining in Gabon. Futile efforts to curtail uranium dust and the extensive leaching of contaminants from the region's many tailing ponds led to the damming of the Matembe River. Trace evidence of its ancient nuclear legacy has since reappeared, but not as a dangerous latency attributable to the cosmic alchemy of early Earth, but rather to that of industrial mining practices. For 40 years, Comov, a subsidiary of the French nuclear giant Areva, mined uranium in southern Gabon. The operation has had serious consequences for the health of the workers and locals. Many former miners, both Gabonese and French, have died of lung cancer. Under pressure from NGOs, Areva opened medical clinic last October. But the staff here don't all have the training or resources to properly diagnose diseases linked to uranium mining. Ça fait plus de 30 ans, plus de 30 ans qu'on a ce, ce problème. Ça fait longtemps, depuis que Komi fait exister. A legacy of colonialism and unnatural resource extraction expressed within the damaged ecosystems of the region and the cellular defects of mine workers and local inhabitants. At Oklo, a lethal archive, once etched into its ancient geology, now re-emerges within the biopolitical strata of matter. This career today is filled with water. And when we have dismantled the old usine of the new usine, all the déchets have been rejected. So, everything that has served to the construction of the usine, the fer, the engines of mines, everything toi été jeté à l'intérieur de cette carrière. Tous les déchets venaient des usines. Tous les travaux de la digue ont duré au moins deux ou trois ans, parce que c'est bien avant la fermeture de l'usine qu'on a fait ça. C'était pour faire disparaître les traces. So my research into celluloid film stock damage. It was night, yeah. Sorry. 
My research into celluloid film stock damaged by atmospheric radiation at Chernobyl led me to the unique case of cesium-137, an isotope that is distinguished by its radiological fingerprint and decay rate of 60 years. The alarming discovery of cesium-137 at the Forschmark nuclear power plant in Sweden on the 28th of April, 1986, offers an extremely rare counter-narrative in the history of environmental pollution wherein cause and effect could be demonstrably, demonstra demonstrably relinked despite the spatial and temporal dispersion of contaminants. Radioactive isotopes found in the environs of the Swedish plant were irrefutably proven to have originated in the Soviet Union with the catastrophic meltdown of Chernobyl's Reactor Unit 4 two days earlier on April 26, 1986. The material witness that would first come to testify publicly to the accident at Chernobyl was not to be found in the vicinity of the exploded reactor core, but was loco located more than 1,100 kilometers away from the scene of the crime. I'll just play another short clip. Sorry. I didn't discover anything. I just happened to be at that place at that time. In the early morning of Monday the 28th of April 1986, Cliff Robinson was about to begin his shift at the Forschmark nuclear power plant on the eastern coast of Sweden. In Monday mornings at that time, there was some routine things that had to be done. One was to go up into the chimney of the power station and to collect samples that had been collecting data for the whole week of the outlets. When Robinson tried to enter the plant, he set off its radiation detector. And the alarm went. It was so strange because I hadn't, hadn't even been in the controlled area. This detector is monitored by a camera, so the radiation protection people, they can see if something happens there. So one of them came down and asked me to measure myself a second time. And so I did, and the alarm went off again. And then he said, well, do it a third time. And uh, the third time, there was no alarm. We both thought it was very strange and that probably it was something wrong with the detector that the alarm level would need some adjustment or anything because it was so just unbelievable that something else would be the cause. It was just, I couldn't understand anything. Yet when Robinson returned after completing his morning rounds, he was astonished to see a growing queue of workers at the detector. At each attempt to pass, the alarm would emit its temperamental caution. And no one could get through because the alarm went off all the time. Realizing that something much more serious might be happening, Robinson grabbed a shoe from one of the waiting workers and placed it on a detector in the lab. And then uh, I could see some sight that I will never forget. The shoe was highly contaminated. You could see this spectrum rising up very quickly and it was just amazing because there were many elements, radioactive elements there, that we normally didn't see in the cooling water in the reactor at Forschmark. I remember vaguely that I had some idea that perhaps uh, a nuclear bomb had been exploded somewhere. Some 29 years later, in March of 2015, cesium-137 would reappear 
in the waters off Canada's western shores. Once again, the contaminants could only come from one source, Fukushima. The decay rate of cesium-137, with its half-life of 30 years, eliminated all other potential sources, including radionuclides, resulting from the atomic testing in the Pacific Proving Grounds in the period of 1945 to 1962. The 16th of July, 1945, marks the day that the planet's baseline radiation level was irrevocably altered. On that day, naturally occurring radiation cosmic, terrestrial, and aquatic, began to be supplemented by newly created isotopes resulting from the Trinity test and subsequent nuclear weapons program, including the underwater operations in the Marshall Islands and detonations over Japan. The 11th of March 2011, saw the largest accidental release of radioactive contaminants into the Earth's oceans in history. Once again, the waters of the Pacific had become a nuclear test site. I'm going to wrap up, but I wanted to present one other example, and this comes directly out of the work that I was doing when a, a researcher on forensic architecture, and it's um, what I would call a sonic witness, and, and so I've worked quite a bit with sound. We had a, a the, there was the kind of example of tape um, 342, the Nixon tape, and also the image from Vietnam. Um, so sonic witnesses that are an inadvertent outcome or an unintentional byproduct of an event, such as the 150 kertz frequency that is the combined results of engine and propeller noise of armed combat drones, and a source of much psychological anxiety and fear in regions of the world such as Fatah, Pakistan, even though such harm does not at present constitute a legal violation of civilian life. So some of the quotes um, from witnesses that have been interviewed by various uh, lawyers and healthcare experts, etc. And this was part of a writing project and also part of a sound um, sound installation. Oh, sorry, I need my audio. Overall, the project of material witness is concerned not so much with a generalized material politics, but with unique encounters between matters and events out of which a heterogeneous and distinctive form of material evidence is produced. As such, the materials of my case studies and artworks cannot be reduced to standing in for mediatic matter in general, but must be understood as historically conditional defined not simply by the coming together of matter and event, but rather the ways in which a specific event and a certain form of media capture have come together to create an evidential artifact. It is their coming together in particular ways that matters, and not merely the fact of their existence. 
This specificity retains its productive value as evidence moves into consensus-making forms, such as courts, that are characterized by generally accepted standards and agreed upon protocols. Just quickly jump ahead. Just going to jump ahead. In directing my in in directing my attentions to the expressive singularity of a given piece of evidence and tracking it through the discursive networks in which it gains its juridical or institutional traction, a conjunctive space is opened up between entities and events that enables even minor forms of material evidence to gather and testify on behalf of much larger political processes. Compiling a case log of modest material acts of witnessing is akin to the method of montage described by Walter Benjamin in the Arcades Project. Sorry, I'm just bring up his quote. Yes, so let me repeat. Compiling a case log of modest material acts of witnessing is akin to the method of montage described by Walter Benjamin in the Arcades Project of creating multi-scalar constructions out of the smallest entities and thus finding the entirety of the event in the precise analysis of minute details. <coughs> to construct history is, as Benjamin suggests, a denaturalizing process that brings into perceptibility that which is neither self-evident that which is neither self-evident nor determined by judgments based upon existing standards and protocols. The momentum of material witness must therefore be understood as intervening into the general, general theorizations of new materialism in which the transformation of things, in which the transformations of matter into things that matter remains crucial but is undertaken with the specific aim of heightening the political relationships that such matter maintains to practices of witnessing and forms of testimony. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. And Anna, did, or do you want to, no. after both of us or after each presentation? No. Sure. Any questions? If you can explain a bit more about the, uh, the specificity of the sound witness and in and the connection, because I, I didn't understand very well the, the, the picture of the nat napalm, what is the history behind this picture and how is transferred by, via telephone. I, 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 if you can explain more about that, what is the... The, 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 the actual process? Yes, and, and also your research on that. What... Yeah, it's simply that I think um, how to say it simply would be that oftentimes what I, 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 I have to do is actually look at the ways in which certain kinds of media artifacts are produced. What are the, what's the technology that actually was required? And what's interesting, what started to be interesting for me in researching this, in the 1970s, all journalists fired, filed their images from the field through things called picture transmitters, which are um, a photograph needs to be taken, printed, and then scanned around this sort of drum. And then it, um, I, I was actually uh, talking to uh, like to journalists, I have spoken to one, in fact, not, I shouldn't say plural, but uh, uh, who was one of the AP editors in Saigon at the time, and he said that these drums that they used, that they're, the drum, you place an image on the drum and you scan it, you, you turn that drum and it actually, it, there's a um, electromagnetic process that converts the gradient of the, um, the, the grayscale image into a set of electronic 
signals, and then that is how the images <coughs> were then transmitted across the world through, and so that the, uh, through Associated Press in, in Saigon was situated right beside the telephone and telegraph office. So the images would be, um, the image editor at Associated Press would pick an image and then they would run over to the, the post office and this is where it would be, the post office was where this uh, equipment was situated and then it would be uh, scanned and then sent as an electronic kind of file. But one of the things that's also interesting, obviously it's a war zone, but it's the, these machines were not very cleared, cleaned, for example, very kind of regularly. So any image that actually was scanned is also carrying the kind of paper traces of all the other images that have been placed on that kind of scanning drum. So one could argue, at least I would make the claim that um, at the sort of micro level, that image is also also in some way an aggregate of all of the other images that have been placed on that scanning drum because there's there's a way in which those kind of material residue um, then is incorporated uh, technologically into the signal file that is sent. But then, as I said, there's even more discussion that says that atmospheric noise was also a major factor in the this tele telephone kind of relay. And so I was also struck by the ways in which the image on the cover of the New York Times is a highly degraded kind of image. The image that won the Pulitzer Prize that we've seen is printed directly from the original 35 millimeter negative. That was never the image that was circulated at the time. That's an image that's been tidied up sort of after the fact. But it's the image that we've come to recognize in relationship to that event, but that first image um, had a rather kind of different character and just through looking at the technology that was used I can make a, um, a sort of conceptual argument I can't prove anything but it, paying um, you know paying attention to the way the technology is actually organized allows me to speculate and to make and to kind of propose that that sort of iconic image in some way carries the material traces of many other images that were also moving through that uh, post office at mm -hmm. the time. So it's, it's, it's a speculation, but it's um, in some way substantiated, or it's a speculation that comes out of insight of, uh, that's garnered from actually knowing how the technology uh, works. And I think for me, that's a, a huge advantage is artists work with, uh, you, know, you know, you get your hands on things and the same with the, um, then the the gap in the Nixon tape there in in all of the sort of core transcripts the lawyers and are, are often talking about the erase button on the tape recorder, the, you know that produced this erasure. I won't go into the sort of the the sort of Watergate history, but there is no erase button on that particular on any tape recorder. In fact, a real to real tape recorder, you only erase by rewinding and re-recording if you like soundless sound, that would be one way that you would erase. There's no such thing as an actual erase button. So the, there, it's not a subtractive process. It's always an additive process. You're always adding. You're not ever deleting anything from the kind of records. So I think just uh, and when you have a practice that, um, it's, not, it's not a specific skill that artists have, but it's just a certain kind of, um, when you're only looking at the say text, textual transcripts from a court and actually um, that may not give you insight into the full kind of technical operations and that's, you know, I have a, that's a particular aspect of my practice that um, oftentimes can be very generative in terms of uh, insights that it, it can um, set in motion, if you will, or, or that allows me then to produce a kind of speculative or conceptual kind of narrative. Um, and then, of course, that um, that particular case I've done, you know, it's I have a massive kind of archive, and I also own the t uh, the mo the same models of machines and things like that, and it's just kind of proliferating kind of project. So, um, but it started with just this offhand comment that the archivist said that the most precious thing in the archives was this 18 and a half minutes of silence that's only ever been played six times because they're waiting for the moment when there would be some sort of forensic technology that could somehow recover the, the sort of missing speech and, and therefore fill in 
the historical record and prove unequivocally that, say, Nixon was a criminal and knew about the Watergate break-in. Um, I think it's much more interesting to sort of speculate and not to leave open the question of all the things that could have been said in 18 and a half minutes. Um, uh, yes? Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for such wonderful material you show. Um, uh, I'm wondering, after seeing your presentation, you know this possibility of agency yes. that objects have? Uh, open up several possibilities. Uh, also, to bring uh, this kind of witnesses to a trial, but also wondering about the possibility of new forms of surveillance. Have you ever thought about it? I'm, th I'm thinking about, imagine the possibility that we can also have these objects as potential witnesses mm -hmm. and also using them as today surveillance cameras are used. I'm, I'm really attracted about the possibility that uh, you offer here, but also wondering on the danger of uh, bringing uh, this new agency to objects. Is that a risk or? Or not. Of course, every, there's, a, every, there's double, the double side to everything. And in fact, there's um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who's one of the artists in the exhibition. Um, uh, he was working on a project um, at the MIT lab where, um, so this is in some way an example where the, the agents are already engaged in those kinds of surveillance uh, modes. So, what it is, is like plant, if you actually film plants or any kind of material that can vibrate easily, like a packet of crisps, for example. I had actually sent Lawrence this Facebook post that someone had sent me about how they're using packets of crisps as, as microphones, um, because if you speak, the air vibrations will actually vibrate the, that sort of aluminum foil of a crisp packet. Lawrence went to the lab at MIT in the United States where they're doing that research and they're actually using plants. And he, Lawrence um, brought back some examples that there would be a plant, if there was a plant on this dais here, and if you filmed the plant with a high-speed camera and then run it through an algorithm, that plant could reproduce my own speech. So you actually don't need to have a shotgun microphone to pick up the speech if you have objects in the vicinity of, of an acoustic wave that are, have properties that, that would allow them to register sort of you know, micro vibrations and you record that and then you process that through you know, obviously the appropriate sort of software, you can actually recover speech. So there's an example where the entire kind of environment, all of the, basically the, you know, wood would not would be a kind of poor conductor, but of course there's many sort of objects that actually can play that sort of role. So I think we're actually already there. Mm -hmm. um, should we, well, maybe one more and then I think we need yeah, okay. to move on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Susan. I, am, I was wondering, you were talking about um, propositional fiction and it's just one doubt about it because I'm trying to make me uh, clear what is a material witness, propositional fiction. Hmm? Uh, and uh, when you're talking about pro propositional fiction, are you meaning uh, a proposition which is taken as, as if? I mean, you're not sure uh, if it's true or not, it doesn't matter, but it makes some coherency or something like this? Are we talking about yeah, this? Yeah, I think so. It is also a way to, and if we think about, um, like also what's the value of artworks, for example, I think that's an important part of the forensic architecture project. So artists are very central to the kind of project. So the sort of, the claims that, you know, can be made also through, um, say, artistic or cultural kind of practices, uh, it's a different kind of kind of claim making, for example, but as, as a, a propositional, fiction in, in the ways that Isabel Stenger worked with it and is quite useful is that it's, it's a speculation, but we shouldn't denigrate something that has, that seems like a fiction because we at this moment can't, don't have unequivocal kind of proof. But it's to say that, you know, speculation, um, 
um, modes of proposition making, which I think are very much the domain of art practice, um, that those uh, shouldn't simply be relegated to the uh, uh, the so sort of sidelines, that they actually can uh, produce different kinds of insights because you can actually work, You, I mean, you have a kind of, um, an artist, I mean, the one thing that I, that I often think about in relationship to the work of forensic architecture, forensic architecture would really have to substantiate all of the move, you know, all of the choices and decisions that are made really have to be accounted for. So um, when I, in my role as an artist, I can move quite quick, I can make, I can put things together to narrate the stories that I need to sort of tell. And there's a way in which I could say, I guess that's a little bit about has a certain propositional kind of nature. I want to say something or, or narrate a story, but I don't necessarily have the uh, materials at hand, so they have to be created. But that doesn't mean that the, the fact that it's, it's a kind of creation should me mean that they can't actually, say, be productive in making a kind of public truth claim, for example. And uh, I think that we should move on to yeah. my colleague, Hannah. So thank you very much. <laughs>